question becomes, how could God uh, regret or, or, or repent himself of something? And someone online has this answer to that. So the Hebrew word for regret is naham, and it's difficult to translate into English. Well, I'm going to have to say, uh, all right, let's see it. Boom, baby! That's <laughs> that's a golden phrase right there. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. And I'm Dan Beecher. And you are listening to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where we try to increase the public's access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and combat the spread of misinformation about the same. How are things going uh, this second time around, Dan? <laughs> things are going great. Okay. I, li- I like that you, you've done a nod to the fact that we started to record this and then uh, had a technical difficulty in the form of my brain not having done something <laughs> it very much needed to do. Uh, and now everything's running smoothly and we're, we're, we're rocking on all four cylinders. So we've already had a mulligan. So if we screw it up this time, that is totally on us. Yeah. Um, if we screw it up this time, you're just getting the screwed up version and that's yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, we're not, we're not going, <laughs> we're not back going again. back again. Uh, Dan, you, my friend have just come back from, uh, what sounds by all reports, like an amazing trip to, uh, the, the the Holy Land. Israel, Palestine, yes. I was uh, leading a tour group uh, there. I was there from, uh, what was it, June 10th to 21st. Had a great time. Uh, it was the first time I've uh, led a tour group out there. We visited a number of spots in Israel and in Palestine uh, and helped uh, a lot of really cool people better understand not only the archaeology and the history and the literature, but also uh, understand a little better what's going on today mm. uh, between uh, these two areas and their people. And they got to meet a bunch of great people from both sides uh, of, uh, that, uh, tension that's, that's going on out there. Oh, do they have a little um, tension out there? Weird. There's quite I, a bit I, of tension I, out I ha- there. I hadn't I, heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> is that new? And, is that, is that a new thing? Quite, no. quite old actually. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I was supposed to be, uh, going with my, my wife, uh, as you know, uh, and then it sounds like the state department is having trouble with, uh, ye old passport renewals these days. Oh, no. Uh, they're taking a lot longer than they normally do. And so, uh, she was not able to go with me, but oh. we had a, a contingency plan in place and I had the, uh, the treat of getting to, uh, text a couple of close friends to my, of mine who know the area very well and had wanted to, uh, travel there with me at some point and say, Hey, do you have two weeks off in a passport. And um, <clears throat> one of them did. So a friend of mine named David Burnett uh, joined me for the trip uh, and had a wonderful time. He's doing a PhD at Edinburgh right now. Uh, and we are actually organizing a conference on on monotheism for next year at Brown University. And uh, I'm hoping to have him on, on the show at some point soon. He's a very gregarious person. Um, I think you'll uh, enjoy him. And uh, yeah, we had a great time. And I was a little nervous about what kind of weirdos would pay a bunch of money to travel to Israel, Palestine with me. And it turns out very cool weirdos. So nice. Um, yeah, it was uh, a wonderful time. I met some great people and uh, I, yeah, got to uh, eat a bunch of great food. I got to enjoy an area that I love. I got to visit some places I hadn't uh, been to before and uh, got to share it with a good friend of mine. So all in all, it was a wonderful trip. That's awesome. Uh, you know, yeah. I should say uh, that this is something that we are working towards, you and I, uh, for this show. We're working towards uh, doing some some tours, various tours. Uh, we've, we've, we're in talks with a uh, travel company right now. So if any of our listeners would like, after hearing uh, some of this stuff, would, would think that that would be a fun thing to do or an interesting thing to do, uh, you can let us know right now. We don't have anything planned. We, our first tour will probably not be till uh, the spring of next year. But uh, send us an email, which is contact at dataoverdogmapod.com. And, uh, and let us know that you're interested in uh, joining us. We'll compile, you know, we'll, we'll keep a list of all the people who are interested. Maybe put tour in the subject line. And then we can... Uh, we can let you know when we uh, when when we're going, how much it's going to cost, all of that sort of thing. 
because yeah. I think a lot of you are going to want to do this, especially after hearing some of what, uh, Dan, you have to say today. Yeah. Because we're, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the stuff that you that you went. Let's, so let's dive into that. Let's let's look at archaeology of Israel. Yeah, absolutely. One of the there are a bunch of different ways to do a tour in Israel. Some of the tours are are all about uh, contemporary geopolitics. Some tours are um, you know school children go on tours to to learn about uh, their uh, their their own history, their people. Um, Sometimes it is about getting having spiritual experiences in in churches, very old churches or less old churches. Um, <clears throat> and what I tried to do was make this tour uh, predictably more about putting data over dogma, and so trying to understand the history and the archaeology. And so we spent a lot of time at sites that uh, many tours don't go to, don't visit because they may not be directly mentioned in the Bible are directly relevant to the Bible, but they are archaeologically interesting and and help us to fill out uh, a better background and backdrop for understanding the Bible. Um, and one of those places was uh, one of the places we visited on the very first day uh, of the tour. The, the first day we started out in Tel Aviv and we kind of went down what's called the Shvela, which is the the transition from the coastal plains to the hill country. So these valleys that kind of run east and west uh, up to the hill country. So we stopped at Beit Shemesh, uh, which is in the uh, Sorek Valley. We stopped in the Valley of Elah, which is where David was supposed to have uh, defeated Goliath. Uh, and one of the things we did in, in the Valley of Elah, we're sitting there looking at this valley, talking about the account in 1 Samuel 17, also talking about what may be the original account of Goliath's defeat at the hands of Elhanan. I was going to uh, say, you, you said David <laughs> defeated Goliath? Uh, <laughs> point of order, sir. <laughs> no, I uh, I saw it on a, a newscast. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I, I swear it was uh, David. Had, um, <clears throat> and they had all the people on the roof cheering for David. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, there's a site like right over the hill from uh, from the Valley of Elah called uh, Kiyafa. And it, some scholars identify it as uh, the biblical Sharaim, which would be the city of two gates. Uh, but there's uh, an excavation that has been ongoing there for a long time that has uncovered some interesting uh some interesting uh, artifacts, uh, and there's even been a handful of uh, books published about some of these artifacts, and an inscription that some scholars argue is the oldest known inscription in the Hebrew language that may date to around 1100 BCE. But wow. I would I would side with a scholar, um, Chris Rolston, and some other epigraphers who argue that this is not yet what we can label Hebrew. Uh, this is still an early alf alphabetic inscription, hasn't transitioned into the Phoenician alphabet, which is what is picked up when Hebrew is committed to writing. So a um, lot to debate about that. But we went further south. We went to uh, visit Lachish, which a lot of people don't know about, but played a very important role in the history uh, of Israel. Uh, there is uh, a... There is a, a bas relief, a wall relief uh, from Nineveh that depicts the Assyrian king Sennacherib's uh, siege of the city of Lachish, where they have siege engines going up the um, the siege ramp that they built to to break down the wall, and they have the the people, the inhabitants of Lachish, throwing. Uh, throwing torches and boulders and things over the the cliff, and mm. you have somebody with a with a big uh, ladle like throwing water uh, on top of the siege engine to try to put out the fires that are being thrown down on top of them. So, so this cool. is a, this is like a mechanical thing that they would use to try and. I'm I'm picturing I don't know it's, it, I'm sure it's, it's not like Iron Man but that's all I've got in my mind right <laughs> no. now. So siege engine is is basically uh, a big battering ram on wheels. Okay. That they had some kind of front to that was intended to protect them and so they would throw torches down on it to try to set it on fire to get okay. you know the people to abandon it and scatter which is why you had the guy with the big spoon throwing <laughs> water on top of it at the same time to try okay. to put out the fire. Um, <laughs> Funny. But Sennacherib uh, memorialized the siege of Lachish in these wall reliefs that are on display in the British Museum now, uh, but cover several um, 
walls within his palace in Nineveh. And this was this became his base of operations for his siege of Jerusalem uh, when King Hezekiah threw off vassalage to uh, the uh, Syrian Empire, when King Hez- Hezekiah basically said, I'm not paying you any more tribute. And Sennacherib said, we'll see about that. And so attacked and destroyed a bunch of uh, towns in northern Israel and then made it all the way to Jerusalem, but was unable to take Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, and so had to abandon this campaign and go back to Assyria. Uh, and uh, and this Hezek- lines up with, with, with events in the Bible? Yes. So yeah, so we can we, have, we can we have archaeological evidence for events that are also detailed in the Bible. Yes. And then we we also have uh, what's called the Sennacherib Prism, which is a, a cuneiform text written around a a um a kind of prism-shaped pillar where Sennacherib boasts about taking all these towns and taking mm. all these people and then it says he trapped Hezekiah in his royal city like a bird in a cage, which was basically him trying to make it sound like he was winning uh, when he had to ultimately abandon the campaign. But we visited Lachish where you can still see the siege ramp. You can still see the the stones that were uh, that were gathered to uh, create the siege ramp and you can oh, go up wow. and see the city gates and um, it's it's just a fascinating uh, place that I really like and that many people who read the Bible, it's mentioned a couple of times in there, but not in any important stories. Um, and then, you also have Lachish playing a large role in the Babylonian exile when the Babylonians come to take Jerusalem and they succeed in doing this a little uh, around 587 BCE. Lachish and Azekah are two cities, two of the last cities that fall before Jerusalem falls. And they discovered some texts uh, at Lachish uh, at, that talk about this event where we have this very kind of terrifying text where they're talking about how the Babylonians are coming. And uh, there's, a, there's a statement at one point uh, where they say, we can no longer see the fire signals of Lachish. Mm. And this is Azeka, kind of somewhat like Lord of the Rings, where you light the fires, the, right. the fires of uh, Gondor calls for aid kind of thing. Um, but the, the signal fires are to indicate that they're there and you know they're, they're fighting. And then at one point, there they can no longer see the fire signals of Lachish, which is kind of this ominous Lachish has fallen, we're next, uh, which is ultimately what happens. The the cities are destroyed and then Jerusalem is destroyed. So it's how always far, a, how far would you say Jerusalem is from Lachish? Uh Jerusalem from Lachish, not incredibly far. I would say if you're if you're driving, uh, you know, it's maybe 20, 30 minutes. Uh, drive on foot. Obviously, it's going to take an awful lot longer, particularly because you got to you got to weave through some valleys and uh, to get up into the mountainous region uh, in which Jerusalem is located. Uh, I only so- ask because, like, part of the part of the thing I think that you, that would be useful about the kind of trip that you took is just getting a sense of the size, the scale of things, because. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've always struggled with as I read the Bible was, you know, it, this was like when we talked about uh, uh, the uh, the the Moabite king, you know, in a battle with all the, and we, you know, I had to go and look up how big each of these kingdoms were. <laughs> yeah. Because I just, you know, you just don't, don't have a sense of how, you know, it's by a sea, is the Dead Sea, as you know, is the Sea of Galilee, how big is it? You know, a, the, the word sea sounds really big. <laughs> and then, you know, you do a little bit of research and you realize, oh, that that's just a lake. That's just a not very big lake. Yeah, it's, uh, it's smaller than uh, Bear Lake in Idaho. It's much smaller than the Great Salt Lake. Uh, and the Dead Sea itself, uh, much smaller than several times smaller than the Great Salt Lake. Yeah. Uh, also, also a lake fed by uh, the Jordan River, and um, <clears throat> the entire region that we know of as ancient Israel is uh, a smaller than the uh, state of New Jersey. So it's actually, a, um, you know, when you're talking on foot. It kind of grows two sizes uh, because you're moving a lot more slowly. But in a car, yeah, you can get around uh, fairly easily as long as the traffic's not too bad, which it sometimes isn't. Um, Yeah, and and as long as you're in parts of uh, driving around in parts where there 
or not a lot of people, which for some of the spots that we were visiting, yeah, we, there were not a lot of people there. Um, <laughs> that's but awesome. that, such as the last place we visited on the first day, Arad, which is a, um, <clears throat> a place in the Negev, which is the Southern desert, uh, of Judah. And uh, Arad is mentioned a handful of times in the Bible, and specifically as a place where there's a king of Arad who comes out to fight Joshua or something like that mm. and gets defeated. But uh, in the 60s, archaeologists discovered at the top of a big hill a Judahite fortress that had been in existence for probably around three or 400 years. And it was destroyed or at least decommissioned uh, out of service somewhere around the year 700 BCE. Oh, and in, wow. the in the corner of this fortress, they discovered a Judahite temple, and they discovered texts that referred to the house of Adonai, which is probably a reference to that Judahite temple. This is not uh, some foreign temple. This was a temple run by Judahites, obviously uh, was administered uh, from Jerusalem uh, was part of the uh, hierarchy's network of uh, <clears throat> of sacred precincts, and the the texts there are also texts that talk about different priestly families that are known from the Hebrew Bible as well. So this is a temple that was integrated into this the biblical world. When it was discovered, it was covered in about six feet of earth, and when they removed all this soil, they found in the temple, a very well-preserved uh, sacrificial altar uh, made of unhewn stone. Uh, they found a, the Holy of Holies. They found a standing stone, so a divine image laying on its side uh, in the Holy of Holies, and they found two incense altars laying on their side just outside of the Holy of Holies. And the archaeologists who excavated this uh, in the uh, 60s, I think this was Yigal uh, Yadin, insisted or concluded that this was all a product of Hezekiah's reforms. Uh, there's a part in the text where it says that Hezekiah went and dismantled all the high places and uh, cut down all the uh, altars to Baal and things like that. Mm. Oddly enough, though, when this kind of thing was done, when you destroyed a temple because the worship was considered inappropriate or unsanctioned or something, you always broke the divine images and the vessels that were used in the worship. And none of these were broken. These were all just laid on their side and covered in soil. And so some other scholars have, have postulated that this is all happening around the same time that Sennacherib is getting set to come through and wreak havoc on everything. And so another possibility is that this was not a temple that was destroyed, but a temple that was decommissioned and then hidden mm. so that it would not be destroyed by Sennacherib. Because uh, following Sennacherib's invasion, pretty much all of the sacred precincts and the temples outside of Jerusalem, which Sennacherib did not destroy, uh, were gone. And this created uh, something we've talked about before on the channel, the, uh, this de facto cult centralization, where because everything else was destroyed and nobody had any choice but to take their worship and their talents to Jerusalem. Uh, so the, there are competing theories about what is responsible for the decommissioning, the ending of the use of this temple at Arad. But most people don't visit this. It's, a, it's quite a bit out of the way. Uh, and it is not directly related to the Bible. And I imagine that a lot of folks who go to Israel, Palestine to go on tours are not interested in hearing about this extra temple that, uh, <laughs> that happens to have a divine image of Adonai in it that you can go, uh, walk up to it. And the, the originals, the actual, uh, items are now on display in the Israel Museum, and I have a, a video uh, on my TikTok channel where I, um, from the Israel Museum, where I'm showing you some of these items and showing you, for instance, that uh, the the incense altars had burned substances on top of them, and those were all sent off for testing and analysis. And the smaller incense altar had uh, three different types of cannabis. 
uh, that had been burned on the top of it during its uh, during its use as when it was being used for worship. Interesting. So but, they they were definitely having spiritual experiences. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, they were uh, they were definitely communing with the Most High. Yeah, and um, <laughs> well, do me a favor, paint me a, a picture because you've you've mentioned standing stones, you've mentioned altars. What size is a is a standing stone? You know, you say you say it's a, a divine image. Mm-hmm. G- give me a sense of the scale uh, of the scale of this thing. Well, uh, the particular one at Arad is probably about three feet high and maybe a foot and a half. Um, yeah, about a foot and a half wide, and it's shaped like a headstone. Okay. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, flat on the sides and then has curves off and has a rounded top. Uh, and then the it's kind of flat on the front side, and then the back side is a little more rounded off. And is uh, it, it it's inscribed? So it's the one uh, the ones that we found. There were actually two standing stones discovered in the Holy of Holies at Arad. One of them, however, was incorporated into the wall, so it had become part of the architecture. They had repurposed this as material for the wall, and then the other one was was free. So scholars for a time thought that both were on display at the same time in the Holy of Holies, but I think the the consensus view now is that only one at a time would have been in use. Um, And it would have been, probably would have been painted anciently and probably would have had the divine name perhaps painted on it. We don't, there was, there's nothing inscribed into it that we can tell, uh, but how it looked anciently would have, would have been quite different. Uh, from how um, how its surface looks today, it's weird. It's weird that the paint didn't survive the centuries in dirt. That's <laughs> in the, in dirt, yeah, it, it's pretty dry dirt. But um, but yeah, the paint did not survive. Yeah. Um. So there there are still debates about this, and and my own in my own book, I talk a bit about the functionality of uh, of this standing stone. How this maybe helps us understand a little better how they thought about and used divine images anciently. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a forthcoming uh, segment uh, of the show. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and then from the top of this fortress, uh, you can actually, it's, it's a pretty high hill, uh, but you can look down on a lower portion of the hill where there is a Bronze Age Canaanite settlement. Uh, oh, wow. With, uh, it has a big well. Uh, you can see this whole city, or at least the ruins of this whole city. Uh, and so it, it's a fascinating place to go. It's part of the national parks system, uh, but not a lot of people visit it. So I've, I've visited there twice, and both times our group has been the only group on the property. That's a great um, thing to be. I'm looking at an <laughs> yeah. image of it, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the top of a hill, and you can see... I mean, it's one of the the higher hills in the area. It looks like, and it, and you can just see for 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 miles in every direction. It looks like it looks really fascinating. Kilometers in every direction when you're when you're in. There. <laughs> I can no, see yeah. I can see for miles uh, because I'm American. <laughs> yeah. Other people can only see for kilometers. Miles are better. Miles are longer. So uh, I, that means I have better eyesight than uh, than Europeans. I think. Well, and th- and that's something that a lot of people noted when they were up there. They were like, "I can see why you would want to build a fortress on top of this place because yeah. one, you can see forever, and then two, anybody coming at you, you know, they're running across open desert, and then they got to <laughs> climb this steep hill the whole yeah. time. You're throwing stuff at them, like it's, um, yeah, it would not be an easy place to uh, to attack, right? Um, so yeah, but how it came to an end is still a mystery uh, to yes. some degree. So. Uh, but but I was very excited to be able to return to there, and I was uh, excited to be able to give the folks in our group that experience of understanding a bit about the history of Israel that is a little off the beaten path. Not yeah, it what seems most really folks are really hear about. cool. Yeah, and uh, and then from there we we actually had to race because they were like we are closing down in like thirty seconds, and so we had to get <laughs> everybody on the bus, on the bus, on the bus, and uh, and out of there. And uh, and then we just cruised on down to uh, the coast of the Dead Sea, which is quite an experience because um, you have these kind of plateaus and, and ridges, and then you just descend hundreds of meters down into the bottom of this rift valley where the Dead Sea is. And we stopped at a uh, a hotel right on the coast and got to go swim in the Dead Sea, which is 
uh, which is quite an experience. Uh, it's unlike any other place you will ever go swimming in your entire life. The only place I've ever been where if you wade out and the water starts getting up to your hips, you start to kind of lose your balance because the buoyancy of what is under the water is starting to lift you off the, the bottom <laughs> a little bit. And so you can't like plop down and sit on the bottom. You can plop down and you will just boom, just kind of float to the top. Uh, and so everybody got a kick out of going out and sitting down and then just kind of laying back and being like, oh, <laughs> and, and you're just floating above the water. And it is, it is an odd experience. And um, if you go, the, there were two warnings that we were given that I'm glad we were given these warnings. One, bring flip-flops, they said, because uh, it's sand for about two feet into uh, into the water, and then it turns into just rock salt and mm. salt crystals and just little chunks of salt all over the bottom. Uh, and then the other warning they gave was, whatever you do, don't get the water on your face. Uh, so... The somebody was telling everybody when they were in the water, oh, you know, taste some of it, see what it's like. And everybody who did that regretted doing that. But, um, <laughs> I've tasted is, salt. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, the salinity of the Dead Sea is uh, is around 10 times what the salinity of seawater is. Yeah. Uh, and it's even uh, a few times more saline than uh, than the Great Salt Lake. Uh, surprisingly, it does not stink like the Great Salt Lake does. So, well, it, it might be too. I mean, the Great Salt Lake smells bad in the summertime because of the brine shrimp, yeah, uh, which then die and then their carcasses wash up on shore and rot. Yeah, but, uh, it may no be fun. that the 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 Dead Sea is too saline even for even for brine shrimp. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I didn't see anything living uh, in the water there, and uh, if there's I one wouldn't thing... want to live in it. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. If there's one thing that I always do when I'm near a body of water is look for uh, fish <laughs> critters. Um, yeah, there's a there's a <laughs> there's an old Far Side cartoon where uh, there are a bunch of like medieval knights storming a castle, and they're running over the drawbridge over the moat, and one of them lo- points down and goes, "Look, a fish." Or something like that, and I'm like, <laughs> "That's me." Um, I would be, I would be combing the the area. I, I grew up fishing, so like when I'm near a body of water, I'm just automatically, instinctively, I'm scanning where the fish going to be. Can I see a fish? Um, so, <laughs> no, no <laughs> luck, no luck on that one. <laughs> Not that time, and, and that reminds me. There's a, there's another thing. One of the other things that we did the very last day uh, of the trip was walk through Hezekiah's tunnel which um, is a tunnel that was dug in order to divert water from the Gihon Spring, which was outside of the city walls, cover up that spring and divert the water to inside the city. This was something that Hezekiah did in order to be able to provide water uh, to the inhabitants of the city. But the And so you can go walk through this tunnel, and it is an unnerving experience to be uh, 100 feet below the bedrock that is the city of David uh, in a little tunnel where for parts of it, like uh, if you've got broader shoulders, you got to kind of squeeze them together. You're kind of bouncing off the the sides of it and parts of it, you have to squat down because it's only maybe five feet high. Wow. Unnerving. But when you get to the <laughs> end, there's a little pool area. And the first time I came out, the first thing I did was go scan the water for, <laughs> for the fishes. And I, and I have a photograph on my phone of... <laughs> I saw a fish swimming around and I was like, sweet. So I have a little picture of this fish. And after I took the picture, I looked at it and I noticed that the fish was swimming right above a Band-Aid um, ah. that was sitting in the water. So I was like, okay, I'm out. Um, that's, a, that's a little less uh, enticing. <laughs> but that that little pool at the end of Hezekiah's tunnel uh, was long thought to be the pool of Siloam because that's that's where Jesus was supposed to have done uh, one of these miracles, but it doesn't really fit the description of one of these pools that would have existed in Jesus's day. Mm. Uh, and yeah, the the archaeology suggests that this little pool at the end of the tunnel was probably built around the Byzantine period. And so people are like, eh, do we call it the Pool of Siloam anyway? Um, when When's the Byzantine period? I don't know when that is. Byzantine um, is like fourth through sixth century is the main kind of the height of the of the Byzantine period. Okay. Um, and this is where we have the empires in Byzantium that are uh, kind of running things. Right. 
And uh, so this is a few centuries after Jesus. But when you're when you're in this area, most everything that is identified with some event, particularly in the New Testament, probably originates in the Byzantine period because that okay. is when that is when uh, Queen Helena, the um, mother of Constantine, came to the area to kind of map out where everything is. And so they literally went around and asked locals where things happen. Um, and so you have and enter and any enterprising local would be like, yeah, I can totally <laughs> yeah, yeah. take you there. How much money are you paying? I, I'll <laughs> definitely show you where Jesus was born for sure. It's absolutely right. So one one of the things you you run into when you go and do tours in this area, um, whether it's Israel or in in Palestine, is you're going to run into a lot of traditional locations, and almost without fail, those traditional locations were identified in the Byzantine period, and then a church has been built over it. Some of them in the Byzantine period, usually uh, in the uh, sixth or seventh century, or no, seventh century usually, or sometimes eighth, they are destroyed either by um, conflict with uh, Muslims or because of uh, a couple of major earthquakes that happened in those centuries. And then usually they are rebuilt in the Crusades, wow. uh, in the Crusader period. So you you get hear that repeated a lot. In fact, our, our uh, when we were there, it was kind of like, okay, Byzantine or Crusader, what do you think? Um, <laughs> Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. So but, but but unlikely to be the actual place that it purports to be. Is that is that what you're saying? For the most part, there are some exceptions. Um, for instance, there's uh, on uh, there's a place called Mount Zion. And Mount Zion is not the Temple Mount. It is a mountain on the other side of what's called the Central Valley or the Teropoion Valley. Uh, and so when you look at Jerusalem, you have the Temple Mount, you have the city of David to the south, and then just to the west, you have the southern mountain. It would have been inside the city gates in the, the time of Jesus, but it's called Mount Zion. And they have a, uh, a church there called the Church of St. Peter in Gallicantu. Or the Church of Saint Peter at the crow at the the crowing of the cock. Oh, uh, and this this the church when you go visit it today, what you see is something that was built, I think, in the in the mid uh, early to mid twentieth century. But it is built over some old crypts. Uh, they some of them are probably um, uh, wells. They are probably uh, for some reason I'm blanking on. <laughs> on the name of a place where you store water. Um, a cistern. Cistern, yes, thank you. I said that word a billion times <laughs> <laughs> two weeks ago. Uh, so some of them are cisterns that were later converted into like dungeons. Mm. And, and the traditional identification of this site is the place where Jesus was held overnight. Um, uh, and it is also identified with the Palace of Caiaphas. Now, most... Archaeologists would say this is something that was probably these were cisterns that were probably converted to uh, dungeons in the Byzantine period or mm. maybe the Crusader period. But there's a set of uh, stairs, there's a staircase that runs uh, just north of Caiaphas's palace that has been unearthed that archaeologists date to around the first century CE. So this staircase, if uh, Caiaphas's palace is anywhere on Mount Zion, and some people think it could be further up the hill where the richer homes would have been. This staircase would have led up there, and so if Caiaphas's palace was on Mount Zion, then that staircase would have been where Jesus would have been led to go from Gethsemane to Caiaphas's palace. So there's a there's a mixture. Some of it is later stuff. Some of these are traditional sites. Uh, and some of it uh, is earlier. And but we try on on trips like this, we try to let people know <clears throat> there's no metaphysical significance to these sites. Like whether it's the actual place where something happened or not, the point is not to take you in and, and let you feel the power of this site um, that is, you know, residually residing there since the first century CE. It's to give you an experience so you have something tangible, something material, some kind of experience that makes those events more real for you, that gives you a, a, a material tether to what's going on. So you can, in your mind, return to that spot and you can um, kind of experience that 
materiality and uh, the reality of that place when you're imagining these stories, when you're reading these texts. Uh, and so it's more about recreating what things would have been like than about saying this is the very spot where this happened. I think that is uh, a great way to look at it, a good reason to want to go out there, and a fantastic place to end our segment today. All right. So uh, thank you for that, Dan. And uh, let's move on to our next segment. All right. All right, Dan. Yes, sir. Something has come across our desk from the internet that we need to answer. Uh, it, is, it is a question from Genesis 6. Uh, it is, we are, uh, Genesis 6, we are about to get into a very famous story in which uh, the Lord makes a, a pretty big decision uh, for the whole earth. Yeah. Uh, One of his and, better known genocides. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a pretty popular one. Yeah. Uh, basically, everybody's going but, uh, but one family, but we'll get to that another time. The question at hand is, comes from Genesis 6, uh, verse 5, no, verse 6. Uh, and there's different versions of it. Uh, the, the King James renders it, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and mm -hmm. it grieved him at his heart. Uh, the, uh, NRSV says, uh, this is verse six, and the Lord was sorry that he had made humans on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So, uh, the question becomes, is God capable of, you know, we're talking about someone, a, a, an omniscient and omnipotent being, how could God uh, regret or, mm -hmm. or, or repent himself of something. And someone online has this answer to that. So the Hebrew word for regret is Nacham, and it's difficult to translate into English. Well, I'm going to have to say, uh, all right, let's see it. Boom, baby. That's, <laughs> that's the golden word. That's the golden phrase right there <laughs> for, uh, for, for McClellan fans. That's the, that's the, that's the good stuff. Uh, this creator, uh, has some more stuff to say. Let's listen to yeah. some more. Okay. John Walton notes, there's no English word that readily captures the meaning of Nechem. In Genesis 24, it refers to Isaac being comforted over the loss of his mother. In Genesis 27, it refers to Esau comforting himself while planning to kill Jacob. In Deuteronomy 32, it refers to having compassion. And in Judges 2, it refers to God moving to feel pity for his people. So right off the bat, I notice a concern from the perspective of a linguist. The idea that we should expect a, a, an English word or a, an English conceptual framework to be able to capture all of the different meanings of this uh, verbal root is fallacious. That's just not something we should expect because these languages are not just giving different labels to the exact same conceptual content. These languages develop the, the conceptual content very differently. And so I would have a concern with an attempt to try to reduce a bunch of different usage in a bunch of different contexts down to a single kind of root concept. Uh, there are times when that's appropriate, but the assumption that that uh, framework can be imposed on any word uh, or any verbal root, I don't agree with. So. Um, I'm going to say that these different places where it can mean different things is just a product of different contextual uses, uh, rather than some confusion on the part of translators. So right yeah, off it does, the... It does seem like, I mean, you know, we have the same concept in English. There are plenty of words that mean very different things, mm -hmm. and you just have to use context clues to understand which version of, of, the, of meaning uh, they're you you know which version of that word they're using for this particular moment. Yeah, and and here the reference to John Walton is a reference to a scholar named John Walton, who in this case, uh, it's to his uh, NIV application commentary on the Book of Genesis, uh, where Walton is is trying to make the case that there is a way to reduce this all down to one uh, set of concepts, but. Let's let uh, this creator, and, and this is a creator who goes by uh, inspiring philosophy, by the way, uh, let's let him 
uh, take over. Okay. The word has been translated multiple ways because as commentators note, there's no English word that can really capture its meaning. What the verse is getting at is that God was deeply saddened by the actions of mankind, but still needed to act to do something to fix the situation. So if we look at uh, Walton's commentary here, what he's trying to do is trying to figure out a way to interpret this in a way that does not allow God to be repenting. And this is pretty explicit. Uh, He starts off uh, in this commentary. I'm going to read through some of the commentary so we can see what Walton is doing. Uh, And he points out that we have a bit of a dilemma here. Uh, The passage seems to be saying that God regrets or repents. And he says there are three ways to seek resolution. One, we can simply rethink our view of God. This is exactly what is happening in the new theology called the openness of God. Two, we can justify the terminology by seeking to understand ways in which anthropomorphic language is used in describing God's actions without imputing human limitations to him. This is the path followed in most commentaries. Three, we can reassess the lexical data to see if we are on the right track when we translate terms in particular ways. And this is the tack that that Walton is going to take and is actually going to introduce a brand new understanding of this framework because the other two uh, ways of approaching this are unacceptable. And so we already have a theological dogma that we are trying that um, we are trying to avoid. We cannot accept that God regrets, and so we have to find another way to interpret this passage. Yeah, the and, phrase "reassess the lexical whatever uh, data." That yeah. it seems like that's just saying that's just a fancy way of saying let's just change the meaning of the <clears throat> words. <laughs> well, he he goes on a little further. The, the job of the lexicographer is co- to come to an understanding of categories of meaning that exist for a word and to identify the common denominators that define and bring cohesion to each category. And so here's where he's saying we should be able to distill everything down to a single root. Um, mm. And what he says is that this word can be best understood in accounting terms. And now keep in mind that the root here is nacham, which is related to a a noun that refers to the womb and generally has to do with great feelings of pity or regret or compassion or things like that. So Hmm. we're nowhere in the lexicographical universe of uh, accounting, but he continues, in bookkeeping, the ledgers must always be kept in balance. Debits equal credits. If the books get out of balance, something must be adjusted. The nifal of nacham, now nifal is uh, one of the uh, stems that is used, and and basically this is uh, a patterns of how we change the verbal root in order to give it specific meanings. And so the nifal usually gives it either a passive or a reflexive meaning. And so uh, like if you have um, <clears throat> the word love, Usually in a transitive sense, you love someone else, Uh, but in a reflexive sense, you would love yourself, or in a passive sense, you would be loved. Mm. So um, the knee fall stem, which is what this uh, verbal root occurs in, indicates it is reflexive or passive. The knee fall of Naham can be viewed in terms of acting to keep personal, national, or cosmic ledgers in balance. (laughs) Now, my concern here is that Walton provides no argument for this does not say, if we look here, we see that it's referring to bookkeeping. If we look over here, we can see it's occurring in the context of uh, bookkeeping, of accounting. There's no argument for why we should look at bookkeeping. He just says, let's try bookkeeping. <laughs> and and then th- next, let's do it in the context of zookeeping, and then we'll, we'll see what it does if we do it in that way. So he he comes up with a few examples. If someone has suffered personal loss as in, and is in mourning, his ledgers are brought into balance by some action or situation that gets him back on his feet by a silver lining he sees to the cloud and has a bunch of different passages where this verb occurs and then says, these can all be understood in these bookkeeping terms. Um, taking this information back to Genesis 6, uh, we're now in a position to suggest that Nacham in Genesis 6, verse 6 through 7, has nothing to do with regrets, grief, or being sorrow, being sorry, excuse me. Adonai is seeking to redress the situation. He is auditing the accounts because 
he had made humankind. Um, so this is this is a tortured argument to begin with. This is an argument that you can't find in any uh, lexicon, that you can't find in any theological dictionary. This is something that Walton invented in order to escape recognizing that the text is explicitly saying God regrets. And, and here's my biggest concern with that. If we go look back at these ways to seek resolution, he says, we can simply rethink our view of God. Now, ostensibly, one's view of God derives from the biblical text, if they are the ultimate authority about God. Why would we need to rethink our view of God in order to understand a text in the sixth chapter of the Bible? Shouldn't this text have helped us formulate our view of God? Right. If we're returning to this text and saying, we have a view of God, and it seems to be out of place with where we get our view of God, <laughs> the problem is not with the text. The problem right. is with the view of God. Yeah, this should have been, this verse should have been formative in your view of God, not exactly. your view of God needs to then inform how you view this verse. Yeah. And so it's, it indicates one the view of god is not based on the bible and i mm. would in, and that's perfectly accurate i think very few people's view of god if anybody's view of god is unilaterally derived from the bible they come from tradition and those traditions are are usually tethered in some way to the bible but more uh of it has to do with uh, how their view of God is interacting with their circumstances and how their view of God serves their interests and their structuring of power and values and how their view of God interacts with other groups' views of God. And so at, toward the end of this, he says, um, <clears throat> despite the discomfort of not having an English term to use in translation, this proposal, the conceptual framework that he just made up and said, let's just slap it on there and it'll work, says... This proposal lends a credible cohesion to the meaning of the root, something that we don't have to have, and resolves the theological difficulties by eliminating any need to explain how God could be sorrow, sorry or repent. In other words, this text can be reinterpreted so it doesn't conflict with the view of God that we did not get from the text. Right. So, What um, confuses me about it is that you're trying to, I mean, I understand that it is difficult. If you have a, you know, omnipotent and omniscient view of God, it's confusing to say God regret regretted something because yeah. how could he have not seen it coming and created it differently? Or, you know, how could he, you know, blah, blah, blah. That I understand that difficulty. But in the next few, Versus, God then acts on that regret. The, like it's very clear that he, like, he created a whole race of people, a whole group, a, a whole, you know, species, and then didn't like it, and literally floods the entire earth, and gets rid of them all. Yeah. So, like, yeah, okay. Even if you found a way to sort of work around the language that says God regretted, he did the action of that regret. So yeah. I don't understand what you've solved, you know what I mean? Other than <laughs> well, just that one little phrase. It's trying to offload responsibility from God, because for God to say, for the text to say God regrets, it means ultimately this is God's doing. And in the text, it, it's pretty explicit. So, Vayinachem Adonai ki asa et ha'adam. So, and whatever, Naham, it Nachamed Adonai that he made, that he had made uh, humanity. So, like his own action, God's own action is the proximate cause of whatever feeling God is having that is descends from this root that refers to uh, the womb and the gut and feelings of, of compassion and remorse and things like that. And so to then say, well, very clearly God is upset with what humanity did is like it's 
two steps removed from the text itself. It's, it first has to reread the, the verb and then has to try to reinterpret the rest of the sentence, which right. pretty clearly puts the, uh, the burden of this action directly on God themselves. Um, and so I, I don't, it, it just does not work for me, but it is a, uh, such a, an excellent illustration of what I've described in the past as the life cycle of religious dogmas. Um, the text is, when the text is written, nobody had a problem with the idea that God regrets or repents. Later on down the road, we develop this idea that God is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent. And the this idea develops slowly over time as uh, ideas about God are competing with other ideas about God and are just kind of enmeshed in this milieu of uh, being used as identity markers and, and things like that. And in the competition, you always want to one up the competition. Uh, our God created this. Oh, well, our God created all this. Oh, well, our God created all this until you get to this idea. Yeah, well, our God created everything. Right. <laughs> And yeah. you get to these superlatives, and nobody can nobody can trump a superlative, and so the superlative becomes kind of the pinnacle of the concept of God in in the this marketplace of ideas about God. And so uh, our God knows everything that's going to happen in the future. Yeah, well, our God also knows everything that happened in the past, and our God knows everything that you've done. Yeah, well, our God knows everything you're thinking about. And then ultimately you get to our God knows all. Yeah. And so you get to that superlative. So then you have uh, omniscience and then you have our God can, can do all things. That superlative, which is omnipotence. And then you have, yeah, well, our God is everywhere. And so you get to that superlative of omnipresence and you can't go any further. But now you have to deal with the consequences of those doctrines. And so once you get to omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence, you turn around and you see, oh, crap. That text says God regrets and God <laughs> repents. Well, time to reread that text. Um, right. And this is because this is not a static thing. You're always having to engage with uh, these negotiations between the text and the ideas and the groups that are competing with them. And, uh, and so every, every dogma that you can find in uh, groups that read the Bible confessionally, whether Christian or, uh, or Jewish or, or somewhere in between, is having to constantly negotiate with what the text says and, and try to refigure out ways to make the, the dogmas that they've developed fit with the text because ultimately you want everything to have descended from the text and the reality is that it does not. It is a product of the interaction of people in circumstances and the text is usually uh, the authority. It's usually just a proof text. Um, and so they got to look back at the text and be like, mm, how are we going to, how are we going to resolve this issue? And, you know, they're explicit about it. We have to re seek resolution. We have this theological difficulty and we've got to try to, uh, make everything fit together, which is just a manifestation of the fact that these, these dogmas don't derive from the text. Right. The text is the proof text for the dogmas, and the further you get, the further the dogmas get away from the text, the more and more work, uh, and the more and more creative and crafty uh, you have to be in order to make it sound like the dogmas and the texts are not at odds with each other. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because you, when, because in that moment where your theology sort of clashes with the text of the of the book if if the text were truly the uh you know if the bible were truly the genesis of your theology then that moment would be a moment not where you say we have to fix the text but it's where we you say we have to fix the theology yeah like my theology <laughs> is what's the problem here but clearly that's not the response that many people have when they encounter this moment yeah. Uh, and that's not wrong. That's just, it, but it just says that, like, if your claim is that your theology comes directly from the Bible, then you're going about this backwards. 
Yeah, and and I think it illustrates, and 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 I think you're right that it's not wrong. It's an inevitability because there's you know the Bible does not exist in a vacuum. The Bible exists in an ever changing world made up of different people and different groups who are all vying for the resources and the power and the values and everything, and so. It's constantly changing, and it's just an inevitability that we have to negotiate with the text. But yeah, I think that's a, an illustration that the Bible is not the ultimate authority. The tradition is the ultimate authority. Whatever your group decides is best for the group is the ultimate authority, and the text is just there for you to point to as the, as the, the proof text, as the authority, when in reality, it has the least authority. It's mm. You get you can decide it means whatever the group decides it needs to mean. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's one of my big concerns with uh, with arguments like this. And I've I've looked around to try to see if there are other examples of people picking up this argument of of linguists of lexicographers going, oh yeah, Walton noticed something that we all missed, and and I have not been able to see anything. Be but the argument does the job for this volume, which is written for uh, evangelical Christians who want to be told that it all fits, that it, that it all works. Yeah. And so if Walton can make an argument that is semi-plausible uh, and that most of the readership will be like, okay, yeah, I get it. I, you know, hooray for us. We got it right. Um, then, then it will have done the job. And, uh, I think that w that's what we're looking at here. And unfortunately, uh, we have a content creator on TikTok who is then trying to, uh, spread that, uh, that rhetorical shoehorn, uh, even further. There you go. Uh, you know, it's a thing that happens all over the place. At some point, Dan, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you come with me to to Kentucky, and we'll go to the Creation Museum <laughs> and, and that see would be... and see what Ken Ham does because he he's the master at at, at these kinds of things. It's uh, I want I amazing. That's a great idea. Yeah, we, we honestly need to do that. <laughs> We're gonna do it. All right. I, I uh, want. I'm I'm not sure if they'd allow us to record in there though. No, no, no. But we. I mean, we can be sneaky. We'll figure it out. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for listening. If you would like to become a part of getting Dan and me to Kentucky, <laughs> you could become a patron of the show. That would be really helpful. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash data over dogma to do that. I hear uh, it's pretty easy. You just head north and then kind of turn west. Oh, shoot, what's the line? Last of the Mohicans when he goes <laughs> he's on the way to Kentucky. <laughs> Dang it, I, I forgot the line. You are you are a flowing font of, of cultural pop cultural references. <laughs> uh, also, a, just a reminder: you can reach us at contact at dataoverdogmapod dot com. And if you want to be uh, a, to be on the list to get information about our tours, uh, our, whatever tours we have, please send in an email, and we will keep track of that. Uh, and other than that, hey, thanks so much for listening. We sure do appreciate you. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.